It is my honor, pleasure, and duty to begin this new season of Difficult Dialogues. But I'm uh, Dr. Dimitri Arujo Shabazz. Thank you for joining us uh, for another installment of Difficult Dialogues. Um, this is um, our third uh, Difficult Dialogues focused on the theme of reparations. And we are delighted to have someone that we've known uh, since our University of Alabama days, Reverend Robert Turner. And uh, he is fighting the, the great fight there in Tulsa to uh, work on reparations for the folks of the descendants of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I will be here if need be, but um, I'll let the other Dr. Shabazz take it away. And thanks for everyone joining us today. Well, very good. Uh, and thank you so much. Uh, uh, we are very uh, happy to uh, launch another installment in this uh, uh, series of our Difficult Dialogues. Difficult Dialogues have been around for a number of years now, but we, uh, beginning this summer in the, in the wake of a lot of things that, were, that happened in the world, uh, from COVID to the murders of uh, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and just so many things, we, we decided, and actually in the publication of From Here to Equality, by uh, William uh, Darity Jr. and Kirsten Mullen just led us to really spotlight a series uh, of difficult dialogues on the question of reparations. In fact, uh, just really taking that as our focus, inspired by our guest today, inspired by Reverend uh, Robert Turner, uh, he has been waging a, uh, a fierce uh, uh, witnessing uh, and struggle uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, particularly uh, every Wednesday going out, um, rain, sleet, snow, whatever. I don't know about snow in Oklahoma, but uh, no matter what, he is out there. Uh, he is out in front of the, the, the city hall, uh, raising the cry of reparations, uh, uh, drumming, uh, being that drum major for the movement for reparations, which in Tulsa, Oklahoma, has a very special uh, particular resonance beyond the general cry of reparations for people of, uh, of African descent, uh, African descendants of slavery in the United States. O Tulsa has, an, has a very special uh, claim for reparations going back to an incident that occurred almost 100 years ago. And the centennial of this massacre of this event is coming up next year. And we are blessed to have uh, Reverend Robert Turner uh, on the ground, pastor of historic Vernon AME Church, which is a part of the Greenwood uh, community. We say was ground zero in 1921 uh, of uh, the conflagration of what happened there. And, uh, and, and you know, the, the language around this that I'm groping for, um, is, is a story in and of itself. Uh, first of all, after 1921, the actual knowledge of the events there were, were almost effectively silenced, just erased from history. You would not see it in any Oklahoma history textbooks. You wouldn't see it in any American history textbooks. You wouldn't even see it in the venerable work of, uh, of Dr. John Hope Franklin from Slavery to Freedom when his first uh, African American history came out, um, uh, you know, and, and, and given the fact that he himself was a victim, he was a child then, and his father was an attorney in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and their law offices was completely burnt out. Dr. Franklin wasn't living there; he was living nearby in a little all black community, all black town of Redbud, but uh, uh, or might be getting. That one mixed up with another town, but he lived in an all-black town away from the tragedy of Tulsa, of the Greenwood community, but his father and their practice was wiped out. And yet even there, there was a, there was a, a hush. There was a pall of silence 
And so this thing has been, has been covered up, has been uh, uh, forgotten for decades and decades, but it has begun to be brought back up. It has begun to be, uh, um, uh, in fact, uh, our, our beloved attorney brother here in, in Massachusetts, former law professor at Harvard Law School, uh, Charles Ogletree, um, my uh, DNI's colleague when we were at the University of Alabama and Reverend Turner's uh, um, another professor on the campus then, Al Brophy wrote a book on the dreamland and, and on, the, on what happened there. So things started changing going into the 90s. People started pushing uh, in, uh, the, the word of this. And then with the help of Ogletree, a lawsuit was launched. Uh, lawsuits were launched, uh, but you had to get the state government to uh, open the statute of limitations to allow itself to be sued uh, by, the, by the living uh, 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 survivors. There were living survivors, and yet they could not get anything for uh, the damages and for what they, they had endured, uh, or, or even a recognition, even a, so, but over time, things have changed. D, D and I and our family, we lived there um, in the early, uh, part of uh, of 2000, just prior to moving here to the valley, and um, and so it has been uh, quite uh, 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 an effort over the years to see the struggle for uh, uh, for the, the the recognition of what took place almost a hundred years ago. Interestingly enough, one other thing, and I want to get to our guest, but the actual rebuilding and the rebounding of the Greenwood community of the Black community of Tulsa. Um, was was almost immediate. Things re people picked up their lives. They began to rebuild, and that whole area was growing and, and became prosperous again. But it was actually in uh, in the '60s and uh, with the interstate highway system uh, and and so-called urban renewal that ran a highway through the community that really put the death knell into the Greenwood community and really uh, uh, hurt the black, the, the black Wall Street that had rebuilt after 1921 over the decades. Uh, Vernon AME has rebuilt and they preserve the, the, uh, uh, the, the hollowed ground of, of, of what survived uh, after the bombardment and the destruction. But with all, all of that, I want to bring forth uh, our very, very special and dear uh, friend, uh, colleague, comrade in, in struggle, uh, Reverend Robert Turner. Greetings, my brother. How are you? Dr. and Dr. Shabazz, I am elated um, to be here this evening, this afternoon um, with you and your lovely wife. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not say to the Amherst community just how blessed they are to have the two of you uh, dynamic individuals. They are so incredibly. Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, New England, you are blessed to have this man and woman in your midst. They are legend, icon, um, and Dr. Shabazz, both of them didn't just start being passionate about this work. Uh, even at the University of Alabama, before I was a reverend, before I was a doctor, before I was a pastor, before I was anything, these two individuals opened up their home to a, just a student activist. I was just a student activist protesting against racism at the University of Alabama. Uh, and these two individuals, faculty members, right, could have been putting their job in jeopardy uh, gave me refuge, gave me counsel. Um, and that, that to this day, uh, I, I love the two of you, and that means so much to me. Um, and in fact, I started using the word comrade from you. Like, I still call my friends in the struggle. I don't call them friends. I don't call them acquaintances. I don't call them colleagues, but comrade, because this truly is a battle. It is a battle um, that we're waging uh, for, for truth for revolution, uh, for liberation, uh, and transformation. And so I, um, I, just, I can't say how much you all mean to me because it's easy now for people, you know, when they see you on 60 Minutes, when they see you on MSNBC, when they see you on CNN and all these other places, for them to 
you know, want to be amenable to you. But you all were amenable to a freshman, 18-year-old, 19-year-old, throughout my whole college career, and you, you all are still the same, right? And so very few people know me today as just Robert, you know, before anything, and you all do. And so I'm so thankful to be on this, a part of this dialogue, um, as difficult as it is, you all make it sweet to talk about because of the funness I have uh, for you. Um, so I forgot your question, but I just want to start off with no, that. No, so brother, no, we're we're here together. I'm, when did you arrive in Tulsa? Because we were there uh, 2005 to 2007, and uh, I'll tell you, those were those were two. Um, uh, very good years for us. What I think made it so very special was the getting to know the Greenwood community and the, and the larger uh, uh, community there in, in Tulsa. Uh, people don't, may not know about Tulsa, but um, it sometimes is in the shadow of the capital city of Oklahoma City, but it has a very interesting history. It has a great tradition of, of philanthropic um, uh, uh, corporate and individual philanthropic uh, activity. Uh, great fortunes emerged in the early 1900s with the discovery of oil and the development of the oil, petrochemical industries, uh, other kinds of uh, um, fortunes were, grew up in the area. And, um, and so the city really uh, uh, blossomed. Uh, jazz had a jazz music, jazz culture grew very strongly there. There's a jazz hall of fame in Oklahoma. Um, there's annual celebrations of Juneteenth there. Uh, we've just found a very strong and vibrant community. Also, I tell people here, because on Martin Luther King Day, our little activities here in the Valley are, are often just so pitiful. Uh, now, partly that's because the snow is so heavy, but uh, uh, oftentimes, but uh, in Tulsa, I would tell folks, Man, it would take old, Martin Luther King Day was a big event. You'd have huge parades, and I can remember marching in the parade, going right past in your your church, going in front of, of Vernon AME. We'd march right there, marching bands from all the all the high schools and and middle schools and and just community uh, organizations. And I mean, it was huge the way it would turn out. And our the university that I was working for at the time, Oklahoma State University. Uh, has an, has a, a branch campus that's in the Greenwood community that's right next door to the Greenwood Cultural Center. So it was really a, uh, a, a vibrant uh, um, experience uh, uh, becoming a part of the Tulsa community. It wasn't very long. We were only there for two years. But uh, I remember then meeting one of the oldest living survivors of the 1921 um, I, I remember then that there were, you know, there was, of course, struggles, uh, the desegregation of the schools. They created two major magnet schools, George Washington Carver Middle and Booker T. Washington High. Uh, our son was uh, uh, at the time at Carver Middle and was slated to go to Booker T. Uh, High, which had a, uh, which both schools had a impressive academics and, and great academic reputation, but uh, it was part of uh, tempting to uh, de school desegregation efforts that was still quite, quite, quite a, a challenge. Uh, of course, poverty, poverty, poverty was a, 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 a deep issue. So when I see the way you're feeding people, the way historic Vernon AME Church is feeding people uh, hot meals and groceries now, I'm so, I'm, I'm just so moved by, by the way you're responding to the needs and the way you've stepped in but why don't you just talk to us about um, wh when you've got to Tulsa and what what your experience is like and what's uh, how how you're being guided and moved to do what you do. I first came to Tulsa, Oklahoma, August 26, 2000, and I came here to Pastor. A church, hey son, all right. I came here to pastor a church, and that church was historic Vernon and me. I didn't know at the time where I was going. Um, I was just informed by the bishop that I needed to 
uh, be prepared to pastor a church that needed someone of my skill set. Um, that same night when I got the call from the bishop about going, um, I had prayed to God because I kind of had a feeling of needing, knowing that it was something about changing my life. And I said, Lord, I don't know what it is, but I just want you to know that I say yes to your will. Um, and as soon as I got off my knees, praying, I look at my phone and I see I have a text message from the bishop asking me about coming to this district. And that was like definitely one of those moments where you know it's greater than you. And so when I came to Tulsa, I realized that we uh, are in a place that is very historic, um, but a lot of people didn't know about the story. Most of my members at, of the church didn't know that the very place where we were. So when I did a when I, so when I first came, I did a tour of the church, and when I saw the cornerstone, because you're a historian, um, and I just love history. A lot of people don't know that the history of that particular church is nine times out of 10 listed on the cornerstone that was laid by the founders. And on the church's cornerstone, it has basement built 1919, sanctuary 1925. And when I told the trustee that was taking me around the church, I said, when they say basement built 1919, I say, where is that basement? And he said, it's right there. I said, and it's still here, right? It's it's the same one. He was like, yes, yeah, same basement we had in 1919. I said, so do you, do you understand what that means? And he was like, um, what do you mean? I said, that means that something survived. We have something that survived the massacre. And he was like, yeah, we we have it. I said, no, it's something that survived. And that from that moment, and I'm switching over to my lap to, to me from my laptop to my cell phone, trying to, from that moment, it gave a sense of hope and, and inspiration for our, for our community to let people know that we have something left from Black Wall Street. We have this huge place called Vernon um, in the midst of total despair. I want you to remind us again too, uh, Brother Robert, when you reconnect uh, Reverend Turner, uh, the exact year. Did anyone else hear it? My, my sound had uh, glitched out a little bit. Did anyone else hear what year he said? Was it 2016? Come on in, Robert. Are you there, Robert? Reconnect. Yes, I'm sorry. I pressed the wrong button. Not a problem. Remind us of the year. Was it 2016 you got there? 2017. 2017. Thank you. 2017, when I first came to Tulsa. And um, it was a year of, a year after Terrence Crutcher was killed by the police. It was... Um, a year that people were still upset that black men were still being killed by police and nothing being done. And um, once I got to Tulsa, I really felt a sense of duty to the members, not just the current members, but the members of yesteryear, the ancestors that were here um, that were killed um, and whose blood still stains the streets. Um, I felt the sense of duty and obligation. And every time I, even now, when I drive up and go to the church, which is every day, um, I feel their cries, you know, and it reminds me of the of book of Genesis that talks about when Cain killed Abel and how the blood of Abel cries out to God from the ground. And, and, and there's an old Hebrew philosophy that says unjustified blood in it the shedding of unjustified blood stains and curses the land right and it continues to be that way until something is done to atone for it 
And I really feel like that that blood has been a stain, you know, and that Greenwood um, is not what the mayor and the city and really pretty much White Toast is trying to make it out to be a tourist site. It's a crime scene, first and foremost. And so from that, from that awareness, um, I began to speak out about the need to excavate the bodies where the bodies were dumped, excavate the mass graves where the bodies were dumped, um, and to be a voice for those that had, can't speak for themselves. But to me, that blood cries out to God. And it, if it offends God, it, it, if it offends the creator, it offends me. And uh, just speaking up, and that gives me the passion that I have every Wednesday. So like the first time I went to City Hall, Dr. Shabazz, it was no one there with me physically, but my bullhorn and Bible. But I knew God was with me. I knew and I felt the presence of the ancestors and that cloud of witnesses uh, surrounding me. And so, so I go, I go rain, sleet, hail, or snow. And we do have snow sometimes in Oklahoma um, uh, just to let the world know. Um, and it's not even about me. Not once have I ever mentioned my name while I was out there. Not once. I, I describe myself as John the Baptist does in the Gospels as the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. And, and, and that's just because who I am is not important, but the people that I'm commissioned to speak for, you know, are. And just to let the city know, in the tradition of, you know, Old Testament prophets, uh, you know, standing at the city gates, you know, letting the powers that be know um, um, the tragedy that occurred in this place that has yet to be atoned for. The uh, the father of Cornell West, wasn't he a yeah. pastor there in Tulsa too? He was, he was. Um, of course he was before me, but he over was- Over in a Baptist church, right? Over in a Baptist church. Um, I uh, don't know the name of it, but I have heard, and I have not had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Cornell West, but I have been told that he's from Tulsa and that he uh, is very, very knowledgeable about this issue. I'm going to reach out to him and tell him whenever he gets down that way, he needs to find that John the Baptist crying out in the wilderness and go and lay hands on you, brother, and pray with you. And I know he will. He will respond. He's my good brother. I love him dearly. And I know he will respond and want to know that someone is carrying on in that in that tradition of John the Baptist. Let's talk a bit about the uh, um the centennial that's coming up. Um, as I've said before, uh, people may think that it's, it's a huge deal in Tulsa. It's, it's, been a, it's become a huge thing because of people working and to making it happen. Brother Hannibal writing his books and the people at the Greenwood Community Center doing cultural center, doing their work. People have, have pushed to make it, make, give it greater awareness. But how are folks preparing for the centennial? We are so proud that our U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren is uh, uh, put forward the bill in the Senate to have the federal government recognize this centennial observance. Uh, can you update us? And I know she came down and, and stood with you. Uh, tell us about that visit. Tell us about uh, the centennial and, and, and where things are. The state of Massachusetts is blessed to have Elizabeth Warren as your champion in the United States Senate. She's not just a senator. She is a champion for all things um, uh, progressive, uh, especially as it relates to consumer uh, defense and, and making sure that we're not exploited by these corporations. And she has really impressed me on her stance on racial equity. Um, I had the privilege of meeting her when she came to Tulsa, uh, not even for a political campaign stop. She, when I met with her, she told me she wanted to just learn, right? So she met with Hannibal Johnson uh, and she met with myself and she wanted to learn more about what happened here in Tulsa. 
Um, and she wanted to go to ground zero. She wanted to go to the last thing standing, which is the basement of our church. And so she went and she wanted, she asked me to pray uh, for her. And I did. And since then, uh, we have uh, engaged in a true um, cordial relationship where uh, she's reached out to me to let me know if I needed anything. She's more than happy to assist in all she can do in the United States Senate. Uh, and then when one of my friends um, uh, told me from the Human Rights Watch about the resolution um, that she authored, I said, I'm, I'm really not surprised because she was like a sponge when she came to Tulsa, just soaking up all the knowledge. And she actually is from Oklahoma. She's so the daughter. story is, yeah. is special to her, right? This is personal for her. Um, and I, I hope that the Senate gets beyond politics. Um, to my understanding, there are some folks who are upset that she wrote it being from Massachusetts, being the senator from of Massachusetts, um, but she still is from Oklahoma. Like I'm in Oklahoma now, but I'm from Alabama. So guess what? I'm always going to talk about issues from Alabama. You know, so just because you leave your home state doesn't divorce you from still being concerned about it, right? And so I, I, I don't think anything is wrong with her authoring that. Uh, and I know the makeup of the Senate right now makes that resolution somewhat difficult to pass. But as we itch closer to the centennial, um, it's going to be hard to be against her resolution. Um, as we get close, as we itch closer to the centennial, um, it it is baffling, Dr. Shabazz, to see um, how many people now are becoming so-called woke, right, as it relates to the race massacre, um, and how many people now are claiming that they've been knowing them about it for so long and nobody just nobody would listen to them and it's it's really sad to see um how the very people that caused the massacre and that were complicit during the massacre are now seeking to profit from the massacre um, um and that 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 is sickening to me um and i don't mince words uh the city of tulsa for one um, that was complicit and outright in the sheriff's department outright caused it by deputizing members of the white mob the, and the city allowed it to happen. The fire department didn't put out one fire. The police department didn't investigate or arrest not one of those white perpetrators. But now the city of Tulsa is the largest landowner in the Greenwood community. Like they own all the land around Vernon Abbey Church. They own the Greenwood Culture Center. They own the land where OSU is. That I mean, and, and it's so bad that developers now go to the city to get land to develop downtown in Greenwood. Um, and, and so they're profiting hand over fist. And now with the centennial coming up, they're marketing it as some, you know, big tourist site destination. Um, but when in fact it still is a crime scene. In fact, the only thing in Greenwood that's in its original location. Uh, are two churches, and they're still owned by Black people. And that's Historic Vernon and Historic Mount Zion. And the only building that is still there in its original spot is the basement of our church, right? And so, but you don't hear people talk about that because if people come to visit Vernon, you know, that's not giving dollars to the city. You know, that's not giving dollars to a private white entity. And they're going to get a real education too. Yes, and they're going to get a real education. That's right. So, the, so you won't see Vernon on any of the, you know, main brochures um, because we don't fit the image that are and message that they're trying to portray. And that's that's to me say, and that's why you know the the current situation of Vernon without Capitol building and needing to be restored. That's why it's in the shape it's in, right? Because the city in 2002, tried to buy Vernon because they knew the history. And we didn't just say no because of the offer they offered. We didn't just say no, we said hell no, because it was so insulting. Um, and since then, they have not sought to help in any way. And to this day, it's like they want it to crumble. 
Um, but thanks be to God, we've gotten some, we're getting support. I've been writing grants, um, but we still need a whole lot more. Um, and even though, and even though our capital campaign is underway, uh, we still are feeding, right? Like you said, we are using this vessel, this space that is crumbling by the minute. Every time the rain hits, every time a wind blows, something falls off of our church. Come on, I'm not exaggerating, but we're still using this same building to have not been the only place in Tulsa open every day since COVID-19 shelter in place, feeding over 155,000 meals. I thank God, and we're not a mega church at all. I wish we had 150 members, you know, but we have the few faithful members we have, um, most of which are senior citizens uh, who remember the greatness of Greenwood and the ancestors of Greenwood, and they're refusing to allow, you know, the demise on their watch. And so I'm humbled to pastor such a remarkable people uh, with a rich legacy. Well, I want you to take a moment to um, collect. I know you were just getting in. I'm going to uh, share a screen now and just play a short video for folks, and then we'll come back, and I want us to, to drill down a little bit specifically on, on reparations, what it could mean and should mean for Tulsa, what it could mean and should mean uh, for, for the United States of America and African Americans. But let's, let's watch this little uh, video uh, for context. We generally call it the catastrophe because we feel like it wasn't a riot. We didn't. We were not the perpetrators. We were the victims. <laughs> but it took 80 years to get the state of Oklahoma to acknowledge that. <laughs> the Tulsa Race Massacre is believed to be one of the worst incidents of racial violence in American history. From May 31st to June 1st in 1921, as many as 300 people were killed, hundreds were injured, and thousands of buildings were destroyed. On June 1st, they began to systematically destroy neighborhoods, and they had airplanes dropping things down on people's houses, and they had made up their minds to clear the entire area of black people. It started after a newspaper reported a black man tried to sexually assault a white woman. Though it's still uncertain what exactly happened, many did not believe that story. The Oklahoma Historical Society said the most common explanation is Dick Rollins stepped on Sarah Page's foot when he entered the elevator, causing her to scream. A group of armed black men went to the courthouse to offer help protecting Rollins once they heard talks of lynching crowd of white men was also on the scene. A shot was fired and the riots began. My parents were very distressed because here they are with five kids and the schools had been. I went to Dunbar School and that was reduced to just rubble. I mean, they blew it up. Crowds of white rioters went to the Greenwood District, known as Black Wall Street. It was home to an affluent African-American community with banks, hotels, theaters, and new homes. They took my eight-year-old brother, too, where they were holding all the black men. And we didn't know because we lived on one side of town and they lived on the other. We thought they were locking up the non-blacks, too. But it so happened that it didn't occur that way. What they did was to disarm and lock up all black men. And then they said to the mob, there's nothing out there now but women and children, so you can do whatever you want to do. And that was when the real terrible things started to happen. It ended when the city was placed under martial law and National Guard troops were deployed. But Black Wall Street was devastated. Survivors never received compensation for what they lost. So that's just a, a little um, piece that uh, tries to, to give a little concise introduction to what's going on there. Uh, I love the clip of, uh, of our dear sister there, Dr. Hooker. Um, and, um, but uh, let's, let's kind of pick up. Uh, I've gotten a few cues of some things that, uh, that B wants us to also talk about. So before the, the um, 
before talking about reparations, let's let's first connect on Black Lives Matter. Uh, we talked already about the Terrence Crusher, the shooting of Terrence Crusher, and and uh, you're coming in around the time of that case. Uh, we also have um, other things that have happened since then. Uh, I believe you all had a street that was uh, painted uh, Black Lives Matter, and that's been a bit of a source of contention. D and I are going tomorrow to Springfield. There's been an effort to try to preserve a mural, uh, a Black Lives Matter thing downtown in Springfield that uh, they've been coming out against uh, to eliminate, but um, we're trying to argue for the for the value of, of that. Um, kind of update us on uh, what's what's happening there. Um, first of all, Queen Mother Olivia Hooker, who was a member of Vernon, and her father um, owned Hooker's upholstery, uh, was run out of town during the massacre. Those were members that we lost and never saw again, right? Um, and we dearly miss her. In fact, I preached a eulogy memorial service for her um, after she passed uh, this this most recently, I think last year. Um, so, but to update you on where things are, we have this uh, Black Lives Matter mural that was placed on Greenwood um, right after, right during the time when Donald Trump announced he was coming to Tulsa, right? At the time on Juneteenth, which was very disgusting. I, I went on the news and I spoke against it. Um, then later he changed the date to the Saturday, uh, but still the weekend. And so people painted this Black Lives Matter mural. It's actually led by this white young lady uh, who I've now had the pleasure of meeting. And that mural has caused, first of all, nobody said anything about it when it was done. But after the fact, we would actually realize, okay, we got a, some, we got something on the street that says Black Lives Matter. Um, and people are being upset about it. Not our people, but, you know, white folks are being upset about it. The FOP came out against it. Uh, the head of the Republican Party came out against it. Um, using some argument about, well, what if we want to put Blue Lives Matter on the street? Uh, how would they feel about that? First of all, I don't know how in the world people are starting to equate my identity with an occupation. Like, blue, nobody is born blue. Like, that's an occupation, you know? So to, so to equate my identity to uh, your occupation that you could leave tomorrow shows just how little you value my identity, you know? Um, so that's, that, that's, that's, that's one flank of that argument um, that I use to counter what if we want to put blue lives matter up. Blue, there are no blue lives, right? There, 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 there are people who have jobs wear blue uniforms, you know, but there are people who have black lives because we're black, you know? So um, anyway, um, but people and the mayor, you know, our he, he's been a coward, um, hiding behind um, folks who who are using those weak arguments. Um, and now he's saying, well, at first he said, well, you know, let's let's I, I've got complaints from people in the black community, right? And then the folks who he said complain came out and said we had complained about anything, so he was not being honest. And then. That's when he said, you know, because I said, well, if, who who is saying this? Just say it. Who just don't have how people say who's telling you who they got they got a problem with it. Then it turns out it's the head of Republican Party and it's blue and the FOP. And um then the city council voted and he said, I'm gonna leave it up to the city council. And we know the city council, majority white, voted to take it down. But they used the excuse because they gotta repave the street. Now, if you look at that street, it's not in that much need of repaving, right? I can show them some streets in the black community that greatly need to be repaid, but they want to choose to move. And that, now they were scheduled to, to repave the street, but it was supposed to be done like in March. Mm -hmm. They're scheduled to move that up to October. 
Why the rush? Because of these yellow letters. Um, but what I told people jokingly is that I see how if you're in the black community and you want to get your streets repaved, just paint the words Black Lives Matter on them and the city will start repaving your streets. Um, it's just, it's sad and sickening that we're that Tulsa would be um, one of, I think, only two cities that has ever removed Black Lives Matter murder. And we'll be the largest city in the country because that other city is a small, very small uh, community. Um, but Tulsa will be notorious for yet again something uh, that's adverse to race relations. And they don't seem to care. They don't seem to care. But in that picture that your screen shows now, you see the little half of a block that they're trying to reduce Greenwood. Greenwood District, Black Wall Street was 36 blocks city blocks yep. and now all of that has been gentrified and they reduced that because other people are taking portions of greenwood and now it's pretty much reduced to that little half of a block which is sad which is so sad and and, and they and they don't even want us to have the words black lives matter on that block you know and even that block that they're showing is not even owned by black people it's owned by the Greenwood Chamber LLC. It has a board, and if the board is not majority white, it's very close to it. So it is really sad the current state of affairs uh, in Greenwood. Now, Robert, that highway there—I forget the number of it. Two forty-four. Uh, what's it called again? Two forty-four. Two forty-four. That, if you continued going down the right from where matter is and keep going. That takes you to uh, historic Vernon, doesn't it? That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Y'all are they right put... there after 244. That's right. And then we... OSU, is, OSU is back there too. That's right. You know it. You 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 know it well. And so yeah. they put that interstate highway through the heart of Greenwood. And that did it. And that killed it. And that depressed property value. So when urban renewal came, we call urban removal. <laughs> People were selling their properties pennies on the dollar. And also, if you look behind in the far north corner of the screen that's on the, the, the page right now, that's the baseball field. Yeah. Further gentrification. We didn't ask for a baseball field, but they put that baseball field in the heart of Greenwood. And guess who owns it? The city. You know, the city is the largest landowner in the Greenwood district. And all this land belongs to them. And any building you see, that developer got permission and purchased it, purchased the land from the city. So they're profiting off of the massacre that they caused. Meanwhile, they don't want to pay reparations. Now, Historic Vernon AME on your website, you have a, uh, uh, a link or something where someone would want to contribute to, mm -hmm. the, to the work of its of, of its maintenance and restoration. There, there is a link there. Didn't I see that? Yes, sir. It's, it's called Blessing the Basement. If we click on that, um, yeah. it, will, it will route you to, to our, I think, GoFundMe page. Okay. That's uh, VernonAME.com is, right. is the website. And giving, it has a giving link on the, on the masthead right there. As, and then there's the Bless the Basement and all the the links are there for how you can how you can bless this Nash this this site that is has been placed on the National Register of Historic Places. It was placed there in August of 2018. So uh, so that is uh, your opportunity. Uh, those of you watching this program to uh, to be able to contribute to bless the basement and to help uh, historic Vernon AME continue into the future. Um, let's let's. You know, we say reparations, and um, I'm so glad to have that, to have that concept, to have that idea uh, uh, beginning to to be talked about more, and uh, people wanting to to enact that more. Um, how both you've been doing Bible study every Wednesday, you've been calling out uh, for for reparations as part of that cry in the wilderness. What are some of the responses that you're getting? What are some things that you can tell us 
uh, uh, and, and, and from there, we'll go into some question and answers because we do have people that are on online that, that might have some things to ask you. But, but just talk a bit about reparations um, as you are, are grappling with it in Tulsa and, and beyond. Um, reparations um, really come from the root word repair. Um, describes what you do after you have caused damage, right? You repair. Uh, it's something that you learn even as a child. Uh, when, when my cousins were making Legos, um, or my son who loves to play with Legos, when he builds a Lego and his older brother comes and destroys what he just built, uh, he has to repair that. You know, it's, 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 it's something that is ingrained in you as a person. If you have what we call home training, you know how important it is to repair from the harm that you caused. Um, so at its basic rudimentary level, reparations is repair. Um, now, the longer you go from the harm, the greater the damage, right? So uh, what, what, what was a destroyed Lego set, now, because my youngest son may have walked on those Legos that were destroyed on the ground, now his foot is injured, right? And now uh, blood is coming out of his foot. And now his foot has got infected. God forbid this stuff, this stuff won't happen, but just use it as an analogy. And now feet may be having to be amputated. And now that reduces the kind of job he can have later on in life because he's an amputee. And now that reduces his quality of life. And that changes the kind of house he can have and the kind of car he can own. And so you see how by not repairing something doesn't eradicate it. It exacerbates it. And what we have in this country is we've had a whole lot of Legos destroyed and never been repaired for. Um, and this country um, seemingly, people, because one of the, the responses I get is that, you know, nobody likes reparations. Like reparations is a taboo word. Ooh, you can't, can't say that word reparations because people just don't like it. And I say, that's not true. If you studied American policy, um, both foreign and domestic, reparations is something that America readily does. They've done it to every group that has been marginalized. They've done it in the 1980s to the Japanese Americans for who were placed in internment camps. And I support that, right? We pay it annually. Every year, the Congress, I think last year was $5 million appropriated to the survivors of the Jewish Holocaust. And I support that, right? Uh, they should get reparations. They should get payment. But if it's good for the Jewish Americans, and it's good for the Japanese Americans, why is it not good for the African Americans? And it has to be because of race. Like there's no other, I mean, what, what, what distinguishes what happens to the Japanese Americans being placed in internment camps in the 19, I think 1947, then it will happen to folk in Greenwood who will place the concentration camps during the race massacre. What distinguishes uh, and, and what happened in the Holocaust was terrible. It's human tragedy, people were killed. Guess what? We had human tragedy in 1921, people were killed, and we had a, almost a century of denial. And then if you want to take it back even further to uh, slavery, 1619, you know, we haven't got reparations for anything. And so the damages are compounding. And so if it's good for everybody, and in fact, now I support reparations for Japanese Americans and Jewish Americans, but a group I don't support reparations for is a group that got it by this country. We pay reparations to slave owners. After the Civil War, we pay reparations. And after the American Revolution, they pay reparations. And so I'm like, how can we pay? I went to the University of Alabama. You talked there. There's a plaque on Manly Hall that says this was built in reparations to the South for the devastation and burning down 
of the campus during the Civil War. The U.S. Congress passed an act that gave 140,000 acres of land that the university sold, and they used the money from that sale to rebuild the University of Alabama campus that was used at the time during the Civil War to train Confederate soldiers. So how in the world can you pay soldiers who committed treason, who killed American soldiers during the Civil War, how can you enslave people and pay that enslaver and pay the folk who fought against you to enslave them, but not pay the slaves? So this country doesn't have a problem with reparations. This country has a problem with Black people. What's that? I'm muting and then I'm unmuting. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. We're we're opening up to see if uh, some of the folks that are on the line might have uh, um, uh, something they'd like to raise. If they can unmute themselves, I believe they can unmute themselves. If they would like to uh, do that, those uh, who wish through the chat room or on Facebook or, or uh, YouTube. We will also monitor those and try to get get your your questions in for the uh, remainder of the time that we have. Feel free. When you ask your question, uh, this is uh, Dr. Demetria Shabazz. Hello. When you ask your question, can you please identify yourself as well? Thank you. And we have put in the chat information about uh, the link to the Build the uh, Bless the Basement campaign. And uh, we've put other things in the chat if you want to take a look there for, for some of the links about things that we have talked about, uh, the GoFundMe and otherwise. I have a quick uh, clarifying question, uh, Reverend Robert Turner. Uh, so proud of you. You know, I, I say that on Facebook all the time. It's just, you know, seeing uh, a young person like you, um, you know, really just emerge and uh, do good work in whatever community you find yourself. It is just inspiring, and it it makes us both, my you know, my husband and and partner, um, really feel that what we do is worthwhile. So it's such an honor to have you here. Um, the mural. I know that there was a news article um, threatening that they were going to. Uh, repave the road, and you had talked about that the road didn't need repaving. Um, what type of coalition came about to save uh, the mural there in uh, Greenwood? Well, I wish that you, I hope that you are prophet and God. Oh, okay. It. Yeah, that's why I needed a clarifying question. <laughs> I Go hope on. that you're right. Uh, right now, the city council has voted to repave it. Um, and the mayor has yet to accept that recommendation. It looks like he will definitely, he stated in other, uh, venues that he will support what the council votes for. Um, but I mean, to me, we need leadership right now. Um, that would be a terrible look for the city of Tulsa to be one or two cities in the whole world. Like, because Black Lives Matter murals are all over the world. And for Tulsa to be, if they do this, and to actually see uh, demolition um, of the of those letters, of those words, would be a terrible look on a city that is trying to present itself as some bastion of 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 a standard bearer for how you handle race relations. Um, it will it will it will completely take the emperor's clothes off. Um, and expose the naked reality that is Tulsa is not much different, if at all, than what she was in 1921. Um, but the coalition that has formed Dr. Shabazz is a truly remarkable sight to see young white women and men and black people 
and indigenous people um, once there was, because somebody did a blue streak on the Black Lives Matter mural like a few weeks ago. And to see all of us out that evening um, to repaint the Black Lives Matter mural um, was something special to see. Um, these are young, unattached, like they, these folk come from various political stripes, uh, various socioeconomic stripes, even various faith, and some no faith, um, but believe in the principle of humanity uh, and that all lives can't matter until Black lives matter. Um, so that is a coalition that I know will continue on despite what the city does. Um, and honestly, I hope if they do repave it, that we repay it again, you know, and <laughs> just as, as we can do this as long as they want to. Uh, it's, as silly as it is, uh, we still have people who don't even like reading the word Black Lives Matter, let alone. Reverend Turner, Reverend Turner and you know, I like saying Reverend Turner because there was another Reverend Turner back in the 1830s. Yes, sir. That, uh, that did a lot for our people. A but, true patriot. Um, Yes, sir. <laughs> but we have uh, we do have a question online here, and I should say as well. I heard you say all lives matter can't all lives can't matter until Black lives matter. I know you saw your boy Nick Saban and the Roll Tide out in the streets. Yes, uh, in their video on that too. That 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 was quite a shot. I love it. I loved it too. I love so, it. Question: I love here, it. Says, what are some of the ways that lower middle class or poor white people? can incorporate the concept and action of reparations into their lives? Yeah, I think, I think um, that's a great question. I get that a lot from an individual. Like how can I as an individual um, uh, bring about reparations? Um, and to me is really about uh, the essence of who did the wrongdoing, right? Um, and because nobody here is like 200 years old, but our governments are, um, it is incumbent upon those actors that are still in existence, like the government, the churches, schools. I was so encouraged to see Georgetown um, give reparations to those slaves that worked on their campus. Um, it's important for them to do direct action first, right? And what that means for an individual is they lobby their elected officials. Right, because pretty much anything you see built before 1865 was made by slave hands, period. So that includes your schools, that includes your homes, that includes your churches, that includes your government buildings. Anything you see in this country built before 1865, nine times out of 10, it was made by black slave hands, nine times out of 10, especially if it was massive. Um, and so as an individual, um, I think it is important to help build this critical mass of support uh, and this rainbow coalition um, of folks who are not just Black who are calling their legislators in favor of reparations, not being afraid to do that, right? Um, because what the legislators say is that their poor white constituents don't feel like they should have to pay for Reparations, because if, if the government does, it will come from some sort of tax, right? So that's money we pay into the government. Um, but if poor whites or middle class whites call their legislators and say, hey, I don't mind my tax dollars going reparations, my tax dollars going to stuff right now in Mars. I would never live in Mars. You know, my tax dollars right now are going to studies on things as mundane as how blue is blue and how green is green. Why shouldn't my tax dollars go to study the worst and original sin of America, which is racism, slavery? You know, H.R. 40 should be a no-brainer. It's not even a reparations payment bill. It's a reparations study bill. Who is against a study? Of all the crazy things we study in this country, you don't, you really, with a straight face, will say you don't feel the need to study reparations, study slavery, and study the, the vestiges of white supremacy in our society? That's a joke. So that's what I would encourage her uh, or him to do. Also, always good to know your genealogy and to know, you know, what role did your family play um, in it? Uh, you may be pleasantly surprised and find out your family was a great supporter of poor Blacks or slaves 
Um, and you may find something more troubling, um, but it is important to know the truth, right? It's important for all of us to know the truth. Um, and, 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 and I think once we all know the truth, we can, we won't, we, we will have an easier path in knowing what our next step should be. I think that's a great answer, Robert. If even, you know, whatever race you are, if you however heavy or light your pocket is, you know, you can, you can give your voice. That's you right. You can add, add to that cry in the wilderness to say, hey, I want to see justice. I want things, you know, uh, uh, done right. I want to, to be a part of repairing the damage that has been done. Dee, do you have any other questions? And, and can you give me a time check? Well, we we are at 6.02, but, um, you know, if we could have a, maybe one or two more questions if folks do have them. Uh, otherwise, we can begin to uh, close out. I'd like to know, uh, Robert, what are some of the next steps? You've, you've told us to write our senators. Um, there's someone saying they definitely are going to write uh, and thank Senator Elizabeth Warren. I think that's a, a no-brainer for those who are listening in and watching. Um, we have a great senator who is not only supporting uh, people here in uh, the state of Massachusetts, but also in her home state of Oklahoma. So I think that should be definitely um, uh, applauded. Uh, what are some next steps that you and your congregation are taking? I know some of the troubling things that I've seen on uh, the internet and in the news have been some of the harassment that you have endured uh, at Mount Vernon, you and your um, uh, church members. Can you speak to what are the, some of the next steps that you all are working on in Tulsa? Yes, I, I will. And before I answer that, I want to say that whoever writes the letter to Senator Warren, please tell her that you heard about that from this difficult dialogue done by Dr. Shabazz and Shabazz, because it is important to let her know who is sounding the alarm, um, because I'm sure, I know Amherst has, a, has several endowments, but I'm sure that this program could use any type of support that they can get. So if you do write a letter, tell her you heard Reverend Dr. Turner on the difficult dialogues hosted by Dr. Mirkar and Demetra Shabazz. Um, and, and then tell her how great of a person she is for that resolution. Um, well, second, Amherst Media, real quick, will be okay. happy to hear that because yeah. they're our partners in this. And um, definitely thank you to Faith and Jeff for helping us do this live uh, broadcast today. So I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> just say it. Just say it. Hey. Speak. Hey. Hey, brother, I just wanted to weigh in. This is Ed Cage out of Amherst, Mass. And I, I recently was there to visit with you, but you were very busy. Uh, wow. Thompson Hall and, and oh, man. Upstairs. Yes, it was a great um, feeling to be in that environment. My dad lives there in Tulsa and Broken Arrow, and he was so excited about the whole thing. But you were busy. And we, we came back to tell the Shabazzas where I told them that I had visited the church and it was the energy was amazing. Thank you for what you're doing, for being taking a bold action to stand out and stand up and speak out. I just I really appreciate it. I thank God for you and, and your congregation and the people that will, will, will rally with you in the efforts of making change, brother. Man, I really appreciate that. And it, it pains me. One of the negative parts about uh, getting visibility is not being able to meet with people that just come into my office. It happened again today. Somebody came and I'm on this call. And so they missed it. Uh, but I really hope that you can find time to uh, come back. And I would love to, to sit with you. Uh, my schedule has just become insane uh, recently. And so to answer your question, uh, Dr. Shabazz, uh, what we're trying to do here at Vernon is kind of what the brother mentioned. We give tours like on a daily basis to anybody that come. Uh, we love to try to tell uh, the story of, of Vernon, of Greenwood. Um, we are in this fight. And when anytime you are seeking change, 
Um, there can be no progress without struggle. I think Frederick Douglass said that. Um, and there is great struggle. See, he says, where there's no struggle, there's no progress. And right now there's a great struggle um, in this city. Um, and it has shown its face physically uh, to me um, with the harassment and the assault that I saw at City Hall. Um, and it was a terrible moment. Um, it is showing his face, even people driving by the church and throwing eggs uh, at someone who they thought was me because they looked like me. Um, and it has caused us to enhance our security. And for security reasons, I won't say what those measures are because I don't know who I was watching this. Um, but I, 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 I'm very much so a believer in, um, as David said, my rod, thy rod and thy staff shall comfort me. Um, and so I do believe <laughs> in, in, um, in making sure that we, we're wise as, as a serpent, but harmless as a dove. And so I won't go much, much more into that um, besides you all keeping us, you know, lifted up in prayer. Uh, this work is not easy. There have been some very difficult days, uh, very tense moments in the several marches that I've led. Um, and I even, I pray for those participants in the marches. We have children coming to our protest. I mean, like children um, and their parents wanting them to be a part of this movement um, which is so powerful for me to see. And we have a diverse coalition of people who are um, coming to lend their voice and give up their time. And so I'm humbled by the trust people display and have given, um, but I'm even more so humbled by the fact that Amherst College in Massachusetts, one of the most prestigious institutions of higher learning in the world uh invited me today and so i just i'm in i'm indebted to you all and anytime you want to carry on this conversation again uh i'll be more than amenable to it well let me well we are prestigious but um you're you're going to correct them there huh no, no, no. We're, uh, <laughs> we have a viewership uh, involving Am uh, Amherst College, our small liberal arts four-year college. We're, of course, at the flagship campus of the yes. University of Massachusetts, which oh, is man. a comprehensive uh, <laughs> university. And we also have our own little uh, uh, Hampshire College here, as well as Mount Holyoke and Smith College. So we have a whole five college wow. consortium. I hope as, as this COVID wow. pandemic uh, wanes and we are able to invite uh, uh, guests up here to to speak and to fellowship with us that uh, uh, people hearing this uh, part of uh, uh, our students in Afro-American studies and uh, STEPIC social thought and political economy and other programs will reach out and think of bringing you up here to uh, to share more with us uh, in the in the days uh, post COVID. Um, I uh, and I hope that as people watch this, they will see that. Uh, Springfield, our big city, just 20 minutes away. There's Gardner Memorial, uh, AME Zion. There's Bethel African and Methodist Episcopal Church. We have an AME Zion right here in uh, 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 in Amherst, uh, Goodwin Memorial. I, I know that's a slightly different denomination, but I'm only saying that you know whether it's in the church, whether it's in our on our campuses, or just community organizations. I do really look forward after COVID when we can actually uh, uh, have you out here in person to, uh, uh, to interact and, and to, to build with us. Um, and um, so, yes, any others, any other uh, parting observations or thoughts? I've mentioned in the chat, the brother that spoke to you, Ed Cage, uh, he and his uh, wife, Vera Cage, are social justice uh, warriors. They are comrades here. Uh, been doing so much in the community uh, uh, across Massachusetts with the Asian American Commission and, uh, and, and, and in other ways. Um, but uh, his father, Ed Cage Sr., is there. 
And uh, we'll have to definitely uh, send the word that even until Ed Jr. can get down there too, that he should feel free to, uh, to go over and try and, and visit, maybe volunteer, help hand out some of the groceries or something, wherever, yeah. wherever you can put them to work. And, um, and yes, that's, uh, that's what we do. I see Tom, is that Tom here? Yeah, Tom is here from our Bridge for Unity. Uh, uh, we have uh, Felicia Savine here. We thank all of you. Sandy Mendel, former colleague of mine at, at, uh, at UMass. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, being a part of this. Lindsay Goldfarb, uh, if the names on the streams are accurate, we really appreciate everyone uh, that joined in that way. Uh, my student in uh, the Du Bois department, Jose Gonzalez, was on through, uh, through the Facebook stream, Eli Bonder. Uh, we really appreciate all of you uh, joining us from the Jewish Congregation of Amherst, uh, the SEDEC uh, initiative. I see Jeff here. We were just with them yesterday. So, uh, so really, we, we appreciate this, uh, this whole uh, uh, coming out to, to witness and welcome uh, our brother, Robert Turner. Uh, he, he brings, you know, uh, speaks from a very deep well of truth uh, and, 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 and inspiration. Um, when we met, it was actually around history. We were really, we were really fighting. Uh, folks had really gotten activated because it was discovered that there were uh, African for, uh, uh, ancestors who were who had been enslaved, who was enslaved on the campus That's right. of the U University of Alabama. They they worked for no wages That's and right. were enslaved on the campus. And they were buried on the campus, right by one of the science buildings. Biology and yet right. there was no marker. There was no nothing, uh, uh, you know, at all. It was as though they, they came, they went, they never were. They were unimportant. And yet, as uh, uh, Reverend Turner was saying, they built the campus. They, they gave their lives for the campus with no remuneration and then not even a marker to say, hey, they, they're buried here. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, it was Robert Turner and other students uh, 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 that sparked up and said, no mas, not, not, on, not, not while we're here. We may all be graduating in a year or two, but we're going, but, but we're going to leave uh, something behind. And, uh, and, and that change was put into effect. There is a marker there. You can go on that campus now and by that building and you'll see the marker. And this is what we've all got to learn everywhere we are, um, you know, whether as students, whether as pastors, whether as professors, whether as, in whatever walks of life, uh, whatever class station, that while we're here, you know, do something, be part of repairing the That's history, right. repairing our memory, and repairing the social structure that holds society together to be more just and to, and to, and to uh, ameliorate the harm that has been done. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. We'll have to do this again and stay updated on things to come. I'm gonna put the word out to Senator Warren. Maybe we can get her in a, in a, cross, in a, in a panel uh, here uh, uh, as well, following up on this, because we've got to get that bill moved out of moved out of the Senate and into law, and uh, and get Trump. If he had the temerity, if he had the the whatever to go to Tulsa on Juneteenth to have a campaign rally, yes. then then uh, <laughs> then let him uh, uh, show up for signing that bill for pushing on his his Republican colleagues in the Senate. And, uh, and in the House to sign into law the bill commemorating the centennial and to put some resources behind helping uh, the last thing standing, helping historic Vernon and helping other parts of the, of the Greenwood community to, to show to the nation, to show to the world that yes, this great and unnecessary and just racist tra tragedy of, of white supremacy happened here, but here we are a hundred years later and we're, we're, we're stronger and we're more united against anti-black racism than ever before. Let that be the, the, the uh, let that bill go forward and approve us to have a really significant centennial this coming May uh, uh, acknowledging and into June uh, acknowledging June 1, acknowledging what happened in Tulsa 
and acknowledging that this will never, ever happen again. Let us learn from history and let us go forward to make a new history that is based on justice. Thank you again. Thank you one and all for being a part of this.